section with Houston and Jim. Uh, today we're doing episode one, our introductions. Yeah. So um, I'm Houston. Um, I'm 22 years old. I'm a game programmer. Um, I've been working on a few indie titles uh, over the last couple of years, and I'm kind of coming close to releasing my first commercial title. Nice. I'm Jim. I'm 22 as well. Um, I'm a, a master's student doing data science. Um, and I guess in a lot of my free time, I've been working on my own role-playing system. Uh, I call Epics and Emprises. Um, sort of like a modified uh, hybrid of 3.5 edition D&D, 5th edition D&D, and um, takes a lot of inspiration from uh, JRPGs. I think that was good. I think that was good. All right. That was good. Um, so, did you want to get into the first topic that you wanted to talk about then? Uh, what do you want to talk about? Well, <clears throat> I guess we can talk about how we first got into Dungeons & Dragons. Okay. Um, I started playing back in high school um, with um, our good friend Josh, um, another friend, Andrew and Nick. Um... They were a kind of a misfit bunch, um, not the perfect party, I'll say. <laughs> um, but I think I wouldn't trade it for any other way, being introduced to the game, than just in the cafeteria after hours. Yeah. Um, I often played with Josh and you and Sean, and we always did um, like these one-shot adventures. We grew up in the age of 3.5 edition, which had... Uh, a lot more complex rules compared to fifth edition. Um, so we were always trying to like find ways to shortcut having to read the player's handbook. Um, and, uh, yeah, our first, um, or the first like full scale campaign that I played in was, um, I ran like, I guess I ran a very short, uh, very cursed game for some of my college buddies in freshman year. Uh, and then, uh, in sophomore year, um, Josh came to U of M's Ann Arbor campus. Josh, our forever DM and co-host of the Iron Light Show. Shout out the Iron Light Show. Um, and uh, yeah, we played a campaign that lasted a little over a year. Did you, so overall, would you say that, you know, it was a really good experience playing that campaign? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, I unfortunately, I wish I could have been a part of it more. <laughs> Um, but I had my own stuff going on at the time. Yeah, and and we did play that game in person, yeah. totally, so. Which would have been very hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's the one thing about, like, COVID era, I think, has made, like, online D&D, like, more pervasive. Um, yeah, that's true. And I think it's easier to run games now that people are, like, more accustomed to running online. Yeah. Um, just like with having Zoom classes, why not Zoom D and D? <laughs> Makes sense. I mean, it's a different world from you know three years ago when uh, we tried to kidnap Jack to force him to play <laughs> with us. Yeah. Uh, we we um, did a little bit of detective work, detective work, found out uh, which dorm room was his, um, and then impersonated uh, like the fire department, or not, not the fire department, the police department, saying that somebody had broken and robbed all his stuff, and we were gonna like knock him out and drag him back to our apartment. Should I cut that out? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> we'll leave it in. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Listen, it's a great game, and we really like it. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes we gotta jump through hoops to be able to play it. Some more legitimate than others. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's that kind of sums up like the origin stories. Yeah, I, I suppose so. So uh, nowadays, um, we're in a game together. I'm I'm running the uh, flagship Epics and Emprises E and E campaign. Um, there's a lot of uh, playtesting, a lot of like mechanical tweaking and whatnot, but uh, it's been pretty cool so far. We just did um, episode four of that, I think, on Tuesday. Yeah. Um, is it really only four? 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's wild. It feels like we've been playing for a while. <laughs> well, we have. Uh, we started in September. Uh, and now it's January. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've averaged about one session per month. Um, and that's kind of what it's going to look like going forward. So. Yeah. I mean, it, there's nothing wrong with having, like, more gaps between your sessions. Um, I think it, it gives time for the players to, like, consume and, to, like, digest um, kind of what happened in previous sessions. And it also gives you more time. To prep. Yeah. But I think also um, I've noticed as, like, my first time really in the DM seat where I'm actually prepping stuff, um, the further I get from... A session the like more anxiety that I feel about the next one and the more I kind of drag my feet about prepping like it's you get really stoked about the next session right after you play and it kind of cools so I think I think there is benefit to like keeping it keeping the ball rolling yeah having it like more regular for sure um, I think would make it easier to maintain the motivation yeah because um, it's kind of taxing to design uh, an entire session oh for more. sure it's gonna happen a month in advance which kind of brings me to where i am with blades in the dark <laughs> yeah why don't you uh, talk about that a little bit yeah so blades in the dark is admittedly not D, &D um but it is another tabletop role-playing game we never promised to be a D, D podcast so fair enough i feel like we kind of baited them in with the the D, &D uh we are sort of a D&D &D podcast, yeah. <laughs> as far as design and dissection goes. <laughs> but we dissect all things. Yep. Um, but Blades in the Dark is... it. I kind of like it because it takes away the heroic aspect from the role-playing genre. Um, and just makes all of the PCs, scoundrels, various criminals in a London-like setting. Um and I've been planning this one shot for it for about as long as we've been doing E&E. &E. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I still have to create my scoundrel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, things get in the way, of course, holiday season. But um, we should be running that in about two weeks. So as soon as that fires, there will be a follow-up. Oh, yeah. Episode. Um. cool all right what else you want to talk about um i don't know did you want to talk about um i guess what's going on in e, &E right now uh yeah i suppose i could i could talk about that a little bit um so uh one of the big differences between dungeons and dragons versus epics and emprises is I wanted to experiment with a hard magic system. Um, I'm a big fantasy nerd. I always have been. Um, but I'm also really into science and science fiction. And I kind of see a hard magic system as like the marriage of the two. Um, so yeah, I, I was curious to see what that would look like. And that's kind of one of the biggest um, points of divergence and this flagship campaign I've kind of designed to focus on that, uh, not just for a playtesting uh, purposes, but also to kind of see like how it works uh, as a role-playing aspect. Um, so my players, uh, Houston, my co-host, Josh, uh, co-host of the Iron Light Show, and Sam, who's been my brother since I was not quite three years old, um, <laughs> uh, they, um, created characters in the system and, um, they've all sort of converged in this city called Cavalosa, which, um, is the center of the, or it, it, it is like the center of magical knowledge, uh, in the setting. Um, and it's marked by, uh, Stormbrave, College of the Arcane. Um, so all of my little players, um, have enrolled in the college and they're learning, um, a different domain of magic. Houston's character, Callum, uh, is focusing on radiance domain magic, which, um, essentially boils down to like the creation of 
photons. So light, uh, heat, uh, ionizing radiation. Um, not yet, <laughs> but you'll get there. Um, Josh's character, uh, Kylian, is learning lightning domain magic, which is the creation of muons. Um, and that's, it's a little bit less um, complex in terms of like what can be done, but it's like very powerful, very high damaging, uh, like creating lightning. Um, Sam's character, Ali, um, he doesn't have any innate magical proclivity. Um, and that was, I, I gave my players all a survey um, before we got into the game. And there was one specific question um, that I created to kind of determine what your character would have a natural inclination for based on like how you responded to this survey question. Um, Sam's response um, was kind of like the doesn't have any innate magical inclination uh, response. Which I, I told him, I was like, yeah, your character can still learn magic. You're just going to have to jump through some hoops to do it. Um, he does have... Uh, there. It's not... Uh, I've, I've kind of made it a little bit zero-sum. So he does have uh, some like hidden power that none of you guys are aware of yet. But um, who knows? Maybe, maybe that all pop up in the next few days um but uh yeah i think his character will eventually end up um doing force domain magic which is like uh the magic that controls gravity and the curvature of space really yeah interesting okay <laughs> We were talking a little bit about like force magic last session. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. It I, I it remains to be seen uh, how Ollie is going to <laughs> uh, grow these magical abilities. Well, you might not have picked it up, but um, his character, when the other two characters are gone to sleep for the night, he goes and trains with a mysterious swordsman on the docks in the city. And uh, he's actually done a little bit of Force Domain magic, although I'm not entirely sure if he realizes that it was him. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, I guess we're going to have to have a follow-up about that when that ever oh, yeah. comes to uh, light. Um, but I've been having fun with Radiance Domain, even though I, it's still a little weak. Yeah, it is, and I admit that some, if not all, of that problem is because I've kind of been dragging my feet about <laughs> fleshing out how the individual spell work, spells work and whatnot, but I'm, I'm getting there. Listen, it's a, it's a system that's being developed in motion, meaning if I pull you in one direction maybe i can influence it a little <laughs> yeah oh yeah that's true i mean i definitely want to hear you guys feedback as we go on and i've like i've a little bit shied away from being like hey how do you think that this should work because i kind of don't want to enslave you guys into like <laughs> writing my mechanics for me right but uh but yeah the, i mean i've envisioned like a lot of different paths uh, of how things work so okay well i mean hey don't don't forget about like using us a little bit i remember yeah for sure. i would stream and i'll just ask chat like all right what monster are we making next and they'll just like oh, throw yeah. ideas out and you know it's fun as a player to like you know toss some spaghetti at the wall you know even if you know it's probably not gonna stick sometimes sometimes it does and it feels good to be a part of the process that's cool So that's E and E. Yeah. Um, what should we talk about? Mm. Mm. You want to sneak peek at what, what I've got prepared? For oh, Blaze yeah. Dark? Let's see it. Yeah. Okay. So um, Blaze in the Dark is 
a system about criminals. Um, and the party, I believe, has chosen to be um, assassins. Is that correct? I, I, yes. I, be, I, I yes. think so. <laughs> um, We're going to be like the nastiest, messiest assassins. There's, <laughs> there's no gentleman criminal amongst us. <laughs> yeah. Just just the dirtiest, grimiest people. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you guys get the job done. That's the point. Yep. Um, for Blades in the Dark, I wanted to go into the system preparing very little um, and just letting kind of the player's actions guide where the uh, conflict would be. Um, but, of course, I would have to prepare something. Um, I've decided that the first target for the party is going to be this guy. Um, and <laughs> Billy Billions. Billy Billions. <laughs> He's um, a little character I've, I've thought up a little while ago. Um, just this entertainer, this international entertainer, who performs on a train called the Hello Q. Okay. Um, and this train, I'm not going to go into like the mechanical or even story design to it but there's a bit of a meta design in that i wanted this train to be kind of like symbolic of the stability of the the session as far as you know interesting like it being on rails yeah yeah that makes sense and eventually not being on rails <laughs> i don't know ah, i see <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how that goes of course everything is, is up to the, the players um but I'm, I'm very excited, and I cannot wait for um, the session to finally fire in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I'm excited to see how it goes. Um, a lot of times, uh, when I've played with Josh, I can't tell what's prepared and what's improv And I think these days, a lot more is improv for you guys than is prepared. Yeah. Um, just based on what he tells me, but he's he's really good at it. I, uh, on Tuesday, ran probably the least prepared session that, of E&E that I've run so far. Um, and it was pretty weird. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, in session three, um, my players um, were investigating some weird... Uh, like patterns of exotic animals appearing in the garden district of Cavalosa. And um, they, they've uh, chosen to work as like varmint control. So um, they're like finding some clues and it eventually leads them to, um, to like expose this trophy hunt for a bunch of like rich trading magnates around the island and other surrounding islands um and uh because they've kind of blown this open um they're uh captured and like interrogated by a mob boss who um is pretty upset that they've kind of like discovered this and tells them um this is a very important day for my investors and my partners, you are responsible to make sure that it goes off without a hitch. Um, but my players being pretty good characters um, decided that, uh, you know, when they saw um, these little creatures being bludgeoned by <laughs> these <laughs> rich assholes on yeah. giant birds, um, they were like, yeah, this is a little bit too cruel, um, and started attacking the rich people, the trophy hunters. Um, and I'm on the other side of the screen, like, well, shit, um, now the mob wants to kill my players. Um, so that's cool. Uh, <laughs> and I kind of, um, took a couple days, I was like, you know, this city, the Arcane College, are really important to the vision that I had for this campaign, and I kind of don't want to, like, ruin it 
for the players. So let's try to think of a way to get them back in the good graces of the mob. Uh, and I, I figured something out, but I decided for the most recent session, um, I wanted the players to kind of have free reign of the city, uh, explore what they wanted to, maybe uh, meet up with some martial artists and like learn some new tricks for if they have to fight. Um, but either way, just give them like a little bit of time to, to amass resources before entering this new conflict. Um, and I prepared like a few NPCs, I prepared a few places, um, and they just like didn't engage with any of them. <laughs> but it's cool, like that's, I mean, I want that always to be an option. Yeah, you can't like always predict I exactly what your players, like which ones your players are going to bite, of course. Yeah. Um, and there's always the, the default switch case, right? Like <laughs> Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Um, we found some trouble. No worries. <laughs> yeah, it worked out. I think it was a cool session. I hope Josh thinks it was a cool session, because I, I, I said at the end, I was like, um, yeah, I it was like completely off the cuff, and he was like, yeah, I'm aware. So <laughs> I hope that was just like a, he kind of knows how I work, not like a, wow, this was shit. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. I enjoyed it, personally. I'm sure um, Sam did as well. Yeah. Oh yeah, um, it was cool. I mean, I've I've played D and D. Um, that's kind of sandbox format. I've played D and D that's on the rails, and I far prefer to be in a sandbox environment. Yeah, I think um, I, this is something that you and I kind of share, like as a trait of just like responding to the players more than like. The players responding to us yeah um whereas with charlie and josh's dming style it feels like the other way which i don't think there's not like a right or wrong way of course um just like compatibility yeah um and certain situations arise more in sandbox games rather than like on the rails yeah well um i haven't really been behind the screen too much on Charlie's campaign. I've seen it on Iron Light Show, but um, I did a guest appearance in Josh's campaign um, a couple weeks ago, and I will say that um, it was kind of surprising. Like, he was like, uh, when we went into this session, um, the there were two uh, countries at war, and all of the PCs were on one side and Josh was like, well, do you want to um, fight alongside the PCs or fight against the PCs? And I was like, dude, I'm going to fight against the PCs. Um, I think that that's kind of uh, the courteous thing for a guest to do, uh, kind of offload a little bit from the DM. <laughs> um, but yeah, whenever I talked to him behind the screens, he was like, I really don't know how this will go. It's possible that the players just like circumvent the conflict altogether and negotiate a way out of this war. Um, and I was like, holy shit, like it's it seems like he has a plan for everything, but I think he's just that good at maybe <laughs> taking things in stride. Yeah. And I'd like to get to that point, but I mean being forever dm he's had a lot of practice <laughs> <So>. <laughs> there is an experience factor yeah um I, he's a naturally gifted storyteller too yeah. but yeah i think uh, i lack a lot in the experience department with time i think we'll both get there like with time um that's the whole point of this right yeah right. um and improve um I think with Josh's campaigns in, in particular, um, we're having a little Josh section here. I guess we are. Yeah. <laughs> we'll put that in the, in the timestamps. Yeah, we'll put that in the timestamps. Um, but I find that Josh adapts to, you know, the whatever his players give him. The, the knives, as, as I've seen some other DMs um, call it. Interesting, okay. And not only does he stab us with them, 
these knives that we give him. Um, he likes to twist them. He'll heat them up a little bit. And sometimes he'll just throw out the knife and stab you with the spear he crafted. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, he's very creative, especially when, like, written into a corner. Which I felt like he was um, in our last session that we had. We had some solo sessions with him, each of the party members. Um, but he came out with another brilliancy, as always. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. It differs a lot from my personal DMing style. I have a habit of, I have no idea what's going to happen this session. And I just kind of go into it not worrying not even theorizing about what the players could do. I'm like, they'll figure it out. They always do. Yeah. <laughs> you know? In that first, like, short campaign that I had run uh, in my freshman year of undergrad, um, I was very much like that. I was like, yeah, I've got, like, a rough sketch. I've designed, like, two NPCs. Let's just see what happens. Um, but now that I've committed a lot more to designing a system... And building a world, um, I have like a pretty bad perfectionism problem that comes out. Um, and I, whenever we play, I I usually spend like the entire day before prepping stuff. Really? Yeah. Honestly, the hardest thing for me is names. I just it is very difficult for me to come up with a name that I like. Um, and even some things that I like at first, I'm like, all right, let's give them an hour and see if I still like them. And then a lot of times I don't. Um, I've got a lot of tools for, for coming up with names. Um, I use anagrams a lot. I wrote a little like word scrambler to, to make anagrams. So sometimes I'll like uh, take a word that's like somewhat relevant, put it through the scrambler and see what pops out. Um, I think one of the best examples of those is um, in a one shot um, we did with Aiden a long time ago. Um, I was playing an old elf um, and I was like, you know what would really work well for an elf name? If I just took like the name of a, like a drug or something and put it through the scrambler. I ended up using Myrcene, which is a, a terpenoid that is sometimes found in cannabis. Um, it just sounded funky. I tossed it through the anagram generator and I got Semarin, um, which I was like, oh my God, like that's an elf name. That's awesome. Um, another tool that I also use is uh, a Markov generator, which... Um, I guess to to describe it in like 30 seconds um it basically will look at a bunch of examples and kind of map out uh how strong the connections between letters are and based on that uh will like probabilistically generate similar things um so i uh a lot of the characters in this city cavalosa have italian sounding names so what i did was went on wikipedia found a list of italian surnames and i just copy paste that into my markov generator source and generate 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 until i find something that i like that is so crazy <laughs> yeah it, it works for you like, it, it works it um i agonize over it but i feel like the names that i get after like you know hours and hours of scrutiny are really good Okay, so I guess in a, in a way, the, the limitation breeds some creativity, at least yeah. in the process, right? And the names that you get are worth it. Yeah. So, yeah, I just... But yeah, I mean, coming up with names has never been something that's um, intuitive to me, so I am really thankful that I have these, like, crutches to fall back on. And then sometimes I need to pull an NPC out of nowhere... Uh, and then you get Kylo Graphite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what was the uh, algorithm for Kylo Graphite? Um, <laughs> so, uh, the Soren chain. <laughs> 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 the, uh, the players, um, wanted to get into the Scholars Guild in town. And, um, 
I had kind of for a long time had the vague idea. I was like, oh man, it'd be super sweet if you had to like solve a puzzle or a riddle to get entry into the Scholars Guild. So um, I gave them the terms in the look and see sequence. Um, that sequence basically starts out uh, as 1, 11, uh, 21, and then 1,211. It kind of, um, it doesn't seem intuitive when I say it like that, um, but if I say the numbers instead as 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, it might make a little bit more sense. Um, you pretty much generate each um, subsequent term in this sequence by uh, saying like the quantities of numbers that you have. So in 11, you have two ones, so you say two one. In 21, you have one two and one one, so you say one two one one. Um, the players solve this riddle uh, by um, pretty much the, the doorman had like a little port that he could slide open and give a thumbs down whenever they gave a wrong answer. So uh, Kylie and I think grabbed his arm and just started like twisting it until we let them in. Um, I was thinking that you guys were going to like think about it for a longer time or that, you, I mean, it seemed like you guys were getting frustrated with it and we're, we're just going to go away. So I was like, oh, thank God I don't have to like flesh out this NPC. Um, but they got in like faster than I expected and I floundered and I was like, well, what do I do? <laughs> um, and uh, there was this guy that I hung out with in high school named Kyle Graf and I was like, well, I guess this NPC looks like Kyle Graf. His name is Kylo Graphite. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, um, sometimes you wear your inspirations on your shoulder. Sometimes you wear them on your forehead. <laughs> <laughs> that is for sure. Yeah. Um, and there, there's no there's no shame in it. Listen, I've I've had some I've had some wild NPCs. All right, <laughs> not ones that I can bring to mind because I drink to forget. <laughs> <laughs> but you know you know what it is. I know what it is. Yeah. I've been there. Honestly, in my games, when I try to come up with names, it's just Frank. Some whatever the last like random person I met, I just throw their random name. Chris. This is the the guard Chris. Of course, if I've like you know if I'm sitting down to like come up with a name when I'm preparing, which I don't really do a whole lot, um, I just I like to take names of characters from other things. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I'll throw a nickname. I, I like using nicknames a lot where people don't go by their real name. They use an alias, the wolf, or something like that, you know? Yeah, that's cool. Um, I think it adds a little bit of character um, when you see that the person chose what they're called. Oh, for sure. It kind of reveals a little bit about them, even though you've just heard of them. Yeah. Um, of course, it works the same if you have, like, elf names, right? Mm-hmm. You can get a feel for their their heritage, their culture. Yeah. And another thing I need to be better about is just having a bank of names that I like. But again, like, it's, I mean, getting names for me is like mining Bitcoin. It just takes a really long time, so I kind of do it on an as-needed basis. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, I guess the default NPC name that always comes to my head is Rick. Um, and I, it's like, it's not a Rick and Morty thing. I think it might be a do androids dream of electric sheep thing. Cause the main character's name is Rick Deckard. And I'm like, that's a really good NPC name, except I, I kind of hesitate from, from using something that's already been used. Um, and, in like another piece of popular media or even a, a, like a piece of media that I really like. Um, and I think it's because in part, like I want to have some semblance of originality and also, I don't necessarily want the association. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there can be some, like, crisscross. Like, yeah. Some mismatches. If I were to put a character, like, an NPC named Rick in my setting, like, I think there's probably a good chance that you guys would, like, treat him like Rick from Rick and Morty. The first thing that comes to my mind is Rick Astley. 
which is a problem <laughs> in and of itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... I think it is important to have some originality to the names, um, especially if they come from like a TV show or a movie, or if they're just too generic where every single person has their own mental image of like a Chris. Yeah. Um, it can be nice to, to you know, throw in their, your Seraphim, Seraphim, Mersin. Semarin. Semarin. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Seraphim is angels. Yeah. A little bit different. <laughs> yeah. But coming up with names, it's it can be hard sometimes. It doesn't have to be. I think having a pre-compiled list of names that you like already like, yeah, super helpful. Like number one DM tip. I see it everywhere. <laughs> oh man. The, so the other thing I try not to fall back too much on is puns. Um, like it is really easy to just use garbage puns as names. Uh, I'm not going to say when, but sometime soon you guys will probably encounter a character named Ignatius McKilligan, or I McKilligan, um, and he's like a serial murderer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, be on the lookout. Shout out for I McKilligan. I'm McKilligan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um... I, uh, I don't think I've ever done that. <laughs> I, I think Good. they're too hard. <laughs> they're bad, <laughs> man. <laughs> they take too long to come up with, and, like, the result is... I mean, sometimes they're really funny. Like, if I want a character to be hilarious, why not? Yeah. But um, sometimes it's, like, you know, I want the players to, like, really, like, dig into this character, but if they have, like, a an off-putting name or something that's just weird they'll just like check out oh yeah oh yeah um but i feel like a lot of the npcs that i use are kind of like um they're like flanderized right oh, yeah. it's just like well you're you're like if i'm designing a character where i'm like yeah there's no reason that they would ever interact with this npc outside of like this one specific interaction it's a little bit better um I, uh, another character that you guys didn't see uh, last session was um, Eugene Applebottom. Um, goes by Applebottom Gene. Um, <laughs> no! <laughs> Is he a cool guy? He's a cool guy. Applebottom Gene just hangs out um, in the park and eats apples. And he's kind of like a, a romantic um Nobody in this city has to be homeless, but um, some people choose to be, and he does. Uh, he just kind of like lives in the park and sleeps in the flowers. You know, that's a that's a lifestyle. Yeah, it is. I I my Callum is a fan of sleeping in the flowers. Yeah. <laughs> As opposed to helping his team do anything. <laughs> um, listen, playing lazy characters is is uh, hard work. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, because when you come to the table, you want to play and you want to do stuff. So. Yeah, you, you want to get involved. <laughs> Committing to the bit of being a lazy PC and just, like, being hands-off is respect. Yeah. Now, lazy antagonists become allies really quick. That's true. Um, I once introduced, a like, a dragon to my party. Um, this was like a couple of years ago. Um, but he was full that day and he promised he would eat them when he got up. <laughs> and then he got up and he's like, you know what? It's not even worth it. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they kind of hang out with this guy and he, he promises he's going to eat them eventually. But, you know, everyone knows he's he's just not going <laughs> to. Yeah. He's um, a bro. Yeah, he's a bro. You want to constantly threatens to kill you. That's just how some bro ships are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to have an episode about some of the design of white robes. Oh, I'm sure we will. I think we, we never really did a proper debrief of that campaign. It, it did kind of just fizzle out unexpectedly. Yeah. Was it when we went on uh, spring break? No. It did was we like, play after spring break? It was pretty much like immediately after the gala. 
<laughs> Which, we could probably do an episode on the gala itself, Oops. but I don't. I wouldn't like to. Oops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, working with like a different rule set, multiple DMs. It was a um, West Marches. West Marches campaign. Got you. Um, where we were running with four DMs at the time, and like twenty three players. This is, I think it was the max we got up to. Yeah. Wow. Um, which ambitious, I'll say, for oh a, yeah, a group of college students. But you know, um, I had a lot of fun with like we. I don't. I don't know exactly how long we ran for. It must have been like six months. It was something like that. We start. I think we started in the fall and ended around February. We started in January of 2020. Oh, oh you're right. And then we had the summer trip to Orlando, and immediately after Orlando, we did the gala, and then okay. it kind of ended a little bit after that. Okay, so that was, that was probably actually Orlando was uh, springtime, so that was probably like March or April then. But yeah. I do I I remember uh, now prepping stuff on the plane ride back. For yeah, the gala. yeah. The gala was like this was supposed to be this really big kind of like boss fight we had for the whole guild of like twenty people. Um, and it, it was successful in some ways and unsuccessful in other ways. Um, yeah, but that'll, that'll need its own video. Yeah. All right. Um, put it out of your mind <laughs> Yeah. for now. I think, I think that's a, enough for our introduction. I think okay. it's enough of our background, what we're doing right now. Shoot. Sounds good to me. We got to do an outro though. Yeah. Maybe not that. <laughs> I was thinking of like a, a like a falling action type thing. Like a, I don't want to end on saying like, yeah, we're gonna make a video about the gala. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair. <laughs> um, closing statements. Um, no, you go first. Okay. Um. Well, I don't know what to say. I don't either. Um, so yeah, I mean, I hope this was cool. I hope this was a good video. Um, in the in the coming videos, we're gonna make a lot of uh, commentary about design, uh, all the all the thought, all the work, all the tools that we put towards the design of these games, and then um, dissection. We're gonna do a lot of like analysis on um, how did these things pan out. Uh, how did the session go? What kind of happens in the session? Um, what do players engage with? What do they not engage with? Um, what works mechanistically? What could be improved upon? And uh, yeah. Yeah. I think the future episodes will probably be more specific as to like the designs that we're kind of like discussing. Yeah, it would be definitely a good idea to have like a m more focused <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's kind of hard you got to catch everyone up and now that we're all caught up we'll, we'll be the straight and narrow yeah josh and charlie with the iron light show have been doing a campaign diary um which is super cool but uh i don't know if that's gonna be how design and dissection turns out because i mean i i have two part-time jobs i'll be taking three classes uh and I think, you know, shooting for one, like one session a month is going to be like ambitious, but I'm going to make it happen. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, we'll have to find something else to talk about in the interim, right? Yeah. Um, after Pragus Fire, we'll be running um, a D&D campaign. Um, so I'll, I'll be able to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sweet. Of course, my availability to do that will be sparing because I also have to work. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we're also working on a couple of games. Um, so there's that. Yeah. Well, cool. See you next time. Yeah, I guess I'll see you guys not next week, maybe not tomorrow or next month. <laughs> but sometime. <laughs> In the future. All right, this is Houston and Jim. Signing off. Signing off.
I'm going to be using all of this footage. It's right back. We're not going to use this, are we? I'm, I'm going to have to go ham on the video editing. Leave it all to me, leave it all to me, just leave it all to me. I think at this point I'm going to have to use all of it. Good morning, gamers. How are the testicles <laughs> on your <laughs> dog? <laughs> Dust and this. This, this. Dust, this. Design. These nuts. <laughs> Is your... We should call it design and disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> Is your day ruined? <laughs> yeah. Okay, we fire for real at the 20 minute mark. <laughs> I can't do it. Mark! Hi, welcome to Design and Dissection. Um, today's episode one introduction. Yep. Welcome, welcome to, to Design and, and Dissection, Dissection. Episode, episode one, one. Introduction. introduction. Welcome, Welcome to, to Design, Design and Dissection, Dissection. Episode, episode 1, one introduction. introduction. Welcome to Design and Dissection, Episode 1, Introduction. introduction. <laughs> you know what we'll do? We'll have a uh, montage of us failing. With the... That's, I kind of envisioned that, yeah. Yep. And then finally, we'll, do, we'll keep that one. My name's Jim. I'm 22. Turn 23 in a couple weeks. 23 is a pretty cool number because it's the number of chromosomes in the human sperm cell and the human egg cell. Um, so it's kind of like a big holiday for me. Um, I'm going to try to make that year count. Cool. I feel like we're getting off topic. We're definitely off topic. <laughs>